Hello, this is Robert Bell from the Intelligent Community Forum. We are continuing our series, No Place But Home, which is a set of conversations with city leaders and others from around the world about their response to the COVID-19 crisis and what we can learn from it. Before getting to that conversation, I'm coming to you from the northeast corner of New Jersey, which is just a few miles away from the epicenter of the American COVID outbreak in New York City. Uh, as of today, on April 29th, the state of New Jersey has conducted more than 200,000 tests among its 8.9 million people. About half of those people, uh, or 110,000, have tested positive for C19. Uh, statewide, there are some 6,500 hospitalizations, which is actually down from 7,000 last week. There are 1,200 people on ventilators, which is again down from 1,600 the previous week. And there are a total of 6,000 deaths. So the trends are frightening, but overall they're positive, uh, though the burden continues to fall most heavily on low-income families throughout the state. State government is making very careful plans for reopening the economy uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead as those metrics, we hope, turn even more positive. So we're now going to hear from a gentleman who is a farmer, a descendant of farmers, and who has combined that incredibly demanding job with uh, nearly 20 years of public service as a member of council and the mayor of Caledon in the Peel region of Ontario, Canada. And in addition to his other duties, he also represents that region, the Peel region, uh, on the board of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and is the interim chair of the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association, which is how I know him best. Uh, and that organization advocates for and provides leadership to more than 400 rural communities across the province. So he is Mayor Alan Thompson, and Mayor Thompson, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. One of the things that we have learned to our cost about COVID-19 is that it strikes first and hardest at very densely populated urban areas and then spreads outward from there. Um, now, Caledon is not so very far away from Mississauga and the greater Toronto area. So what's the situation in your community as of today? Well, we're part of the Peel region, Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon. We all make up the region of Peel, which was a county and now a region. And uh, we have 1.5 million people in our, our region altogether. And Caledon, we're about uh, 75,000. Mississauga's, we're a tenth of Mississauga. They have about 750,000 and Brampton is very close to 700,000 people. So just to put it into perspective of how we got there, um, that's um, where, we're, where we're at. And right now with cases, absolutely, uh, the more dense population areas like Toronto, our big urban areas uh, through Ontario uh, has been hit hard, um, especially now into our long-term care uh, uh, and nursing homes. Uh, this is becoming a real, um, that's our main focus of where to fight the virus. Uh, we understand what New York and Jersey's gone through, but I always sit, been watching the numbers as they've been coming in, especially with Caledon. We have a lot of seniors in our community as well. But uh, I've always figured I follow, if I'm about 10% of Mississauga, I'm doing, doing well. Actually, we have dropped down. The urban areas where it's highly densely populated, uh, that's where the COVID virus is going up right now. So we're, we're sitting here roughly, we have about 67 uh, cases right now uh, with two deaths. Out of a whole, out of Peel, with the number of cases that we do have, I believe we're around about 2,100. So we're about two, two and a half percent uh, versus 10 percent, which is good. But uh, it's definitely a, a huge wake-up call for us, for us all. Uh, back, uh, I have to say, uh, back in uh, March, we did. We were one of the first municipalities to bring the emergency, uh, declare emergency so we could get our uh, team up and run, our operations up and running. Now, I think that helped a lot. And uh, we really discouraged every way we could to get people to, um, you know, to keep uh, distance from one another. And I think it's paid off, it really has. And now in Ontario, uh, we've, you know, passed that, that you know, golden disease uh, part of the disease control. We've kind of come through that, uh, golden window and uh, we've peaked and we're coming we're down 
at a lower level, especially rural Ontario, we're not too bad. We really haven't had any major cases of late, uh, other than the odd long-term care facility uh, like Bob Cajun or out in uh, um, in uh, Haldeman County as well, uh, Hagersville um, we've had one. But on the whole, we're not too bad. But the trouble is, is the urban centers are the problem. So if you go to open up uh, to the rural communities that are allowed to start to move around, the urban centers are going to come. And especially when I'm part of Peel Region, I'm 56% of the landmass of Peel Region. So <laughs> and I'm only about the 10th of the population. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, we've got to be so careful on how we restart the economy, but it's something that we have to take very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the challenge is the, the lessons you learn from talking to some of the communities and reading the news, you know, is you go from, from a place like uh, Sweden, for instance, where they really haven't done much to enforce social distancing, but they've focused all their efforts on their most vulnerable population. That seems to be producing good results. Um, in other places, you, you know, you just have this, we, we try to basically shut down early and fast. And that's something I've taken away from conversations I've had is waiting till you know more is not an option in this kind of thing. And it sounds like that's a lesson you took on board. I think because Pearson Airport is in our municipality as well, the region appeal. And uh, that's our business, the airport in Canada, one of the busiest in North America, I think third. Um, I think what we should have done is... Uh, brought more quarantine efforts in place, asking people uh, to self-quarantine right away. Uh, we should have had a flyer to every passenger getting off the plane um, to make sure to self-quarantine. And I think we could have controlled the spread a little quicker, a little sooner, but it's all learning. And we're all learning with this, I'm not point and blame on anybody. I think it's a wake up call. I do believe uh, if you look back at how do you remember the Tylenol scare and all of a sudden it changed all the lid, lids on the bottles. It, it, it changed the way how we do things. 9-11 on how we travel, air travel, uh, anywhere. Um, it changed everything. And I always said the mad, mad cow disease has definitely changed uh, the livestock industry as well uh, through North America. And it's never fully recovered. So I think this is going to be a new norm. Things aren't going to come back to normal uh, as we've experienced. Uh, this is going to be a new normal that we're all going to learn. And I think it's going to prioritize what's the most important to us and prioritize what is really necessary and what's essential. Yeah, it's, it's a, you're right. We're always, I mean, you're always fighting the last war. It's just the nature of the beast. But let's talk for a minute. You, you mentioned, you know, the, the rural nature of Caledon, but also you, of course, are, are chair of an organization with more than 400 rural communities as members. Are you hearing similar stories from them or is it a more of a mixed picture? Uh, it's been a real challenge. Uh, Northern Ontario, uh, very small municipalities, uh, when they've had to shut things down it almost it's really the mayor and the clerk that are left running the municipality. Um, and a lot of these people are business people as well. And uh, so it's been a real struggle for the rural, rural economies as well. And uh, the other issue that we're really finding <laughs> and we're talking about an intelligent community forum is the lack of uh, having reliable broadband. And, uh, you know, the one thing I think what's happened is here we have a monopoly uh, when it comes to telco users and uh, they oversubscribe the cell towers. Everybody's living from home. Kids are trying to educate. People are streaming. They're trying to do everything, trying to work from home. And our s system that was medium to bad has gone worse. <laughs> and this has been a real challenge. And telehealth, uh, which is really essential for uh, remote areas, uh, rural areas through Ontario. I know there's probably 120 municipalities alone that were really hoping that telehealth could help them through some tough times here. And it's, it just hasn't been able, because there hasn't been adequate broadband to make it work. So I think it's been a wake up call that this is uh, infrastructure that's essential, uh, similar to what hydro was a hundred years ago, uh, connecting all our communities across the country and uh, fiber, fiber is the gold standard that has to work because uh, t cell towers, uh, satellites um, that we have with some that are uh, selling uh, that software as well, uh, 
the problem is they oversubscribe and then you have nothing. And that's the problem. Yeah. Well, so. exactly. And, and it's, you, know, you talked about, about us learning from this experience what's essential. One of the things, of course, that we've been talking about for 20 years in, in the Intelligent Community Forum, and you, you obviously know very well, is that broadband is essential. Well, I think that debate ought to be over at this point. Uh, I think so. So much of our life depends <laughs> upon it. And, and I think that's exactly, uh, uh, you've nailed it right there, is enough of the talk. Let's figure out how to put it all together. Um, it doesn't matter if people are trying to communicate through cell phone technology and it's the calls are being dropped. Um, look at all the challenges we're having with our webinars <laughs> and uh, trying to meet online. And I'm going to tell you, I think of what this is, we've reached the golden age of telecommunications and this has really happened like what we're even doing here today. Um, this is the new standard on doing business. And I think we have to figure out Okay, how do we make this happen? And I do believe as much as always a disaster like this, this is when the best innovation and the creativity really comes to work. And instead of pointing fingers at the telcos, my challenge as the leader, along with uh, Jamie uh, McGarvey, uh, who is the chair of AMO, we both did a joint letter. We reached out to all the big providers, the Bell, the Rogers, the Shaws, um, ExploreNet, and uh, TELUS. <clears throat> And we, we said to all of them, look, we're not pointing fingers. We know we're, you've been severely compromised in being able to deliver broadband as it's needed. We're encouraging you to all work together and let's create some innovation here and figure out our ways out of it. And uh, we've seen that with the wars, with the innovation. And you saw that, you know, um, war is a terrible thing. But if you ever look at the World War II is a really good example, how everything became mechanized overnight. It just it didn't change the industry, it changed agriculture. Look at the change of planes and tanks from what the start of the war to the end of the war. Um, the generations of technology that came in to develop things. I look at Desert Storm, I you know, put my farmer hat on. Uh, last night I was out uh, uh, tilling my fields and it's all satellite positioning, auto steer the whole nine yards. And you know, if it wasn't for Desert Storm, we wouldn't have that technology in place for precision farming that we had experienced today. But again, I can't even download that in my home computer. <laughs> I don't have the bandwidth to do it. <laughs> leadership, and you've already referenced this, leadership is a tough job, tough job at any time. It's, I'm always, you know, respect so much people who sign, who volunteer to become political leaders because there's really not that much reward for it. Uh, how are you and your colleagues coping with, with not just the new demands, but more importantly, the, just the terrible uncertainty that we all face here with, with COVID-19? And, you know, I got to tell you, as, as a leader in municipal experience, um, and even in my career in life, this has been the hardest decisions, um, especially laying off staff on, you know, for so they can get uh, emergency help from the federal and provincial governments uh, for, for their time off. Um, this has been a very tough one because you're dealing, it's everybody's life. Um, as the safety of your municipality and the safety of your people, there's a huge, you're aware of a huge responsibility. Um, it's heavy. And I'm going to tell you the decisions you have to make and the timeliness. And I, I'll tell you one thing, you have to move quickly. You have to do your homework. Um, I think really through this past 50 days, if you ask me, it's I'm probably more mentally drained than I've ever, ever experienced. And it's because you're trying to make sure you're making the right decision with the good science that you have available for you to work with and, uh, and to move and be nimble. And, and I think this is the one thing about the industry going forward. And I think, again, uh, the talent, I think it's very timely for you to reach out and ask, because Robert, like you look at uh, what we're talking about here, um, it's about being quick, nimble, and being able to adapt on change. And I know when the first, we were getting a break of this COVID, you experienced this in New Jersey and your governor, it was changing by the hour and how to adapt and reprogram and say, okay, we're going to change and how to shift. And I have to say, the staff that I have been working with, I am so blessed. They were so understanding willing to make those changes and shifts. And, uh, you know, I, I could tell you over four days, we had rechanged our direction about eight or nine times 
never complained once. We all knew our feet are on the ground and it was delivering to keep our, 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 uh, our people safe, our family safe. And, and I think that was a key focus. But uh, you mentioned it being like war. Yeah, it's, it, there's a certain analogy there, isn't there? It is. And it's, and it's adapt because you just don't know what's coming at you or what changes. And, uh, you know, and people wanting to come to our community to enjoy and time out. I'm locked at home. I got to get out of my condo and claustrophobic. Yeah, but don't come and contaminate my community either. Like, you know, it's uh, uh, this thing saying uh, we have a, um, a trailway that's 37 kilometers long that runs uh, across our or perpendicular across our municipality and it's open for people to to come out and be able to but again it's it's you you know we just have to keep reminding people you can't stand in a cluster keep moving it's for everybody to enjoy but you got to have something for people to exercise but i'm just using that as an example that uh, is uh, extremely challenging and uh, seeing the experience that uh, especially as you said with new jersey and new york Oh my gosh, uh, my heart goes out to the mayors and the governors um, with what they're having to deal with. It's and again, the innovation that our local communities have accomplished uh, in developing new ways of uh, protecting our uh, cashiers, you know, building uh, plexiglass cabinets, and the innovation and thought that's gone in to make it extremely efficient from the first ones were the box to having it very practical for the person to work safely, um, especially the PPE uh, equipment that we're all building here within our uh, own province, our own municipality. Um, you know, people that have been in manufacturing are how they've been able to regroup, uh, especially for hand uh, sanitizers and different things. Uh, it's amazing how our communities and the innovation has come forward to how to rally together to help support our communities. It's been amazing. What are some of those, so you've mentioned a couple of times now, these innovations that happen when we're under terrible, terrible pressure. Uh, you know, it's happening in government, it's happening in business, it's happening in nonprofit institutions. What are some of sort of the striking examples that you've seen that you think are, are worth talking about? The one thing is uh, even just uh, the municipality just north of me is Orangeville. Uh, they live in Caledon, <laughs> uh, developed a, a more efficient headgear for the uh, hospitals and the healthcare workers to be able to use on the front line. And uh, something that they've been able to adapt uh, rather quickly and saying, hey, we can make these. But after talking to health professionals and finding what we said, we can reduce the risk and having you less compromised with this new design and been able to get it out and get it processed. And again, to do something like that, you'd have, they had to go through all the levels of, you know, through the health to get everything approved. But what would normally take months or a year to do, they've got it done in weeks so that they can get it out to serve the community. And I think that's um, the one thing I've definitely noticed. Another way is the communities too, is making sure the food banks being able to, uh, before everybody donated food, but the streamlined processes of how to get food to the people and back to the people. Uh, restaurants um, are a lot of other ways, you know, get past the PPE. There's many other things that I've seen as how the community is taking care of one another. Um, even portals being created to uh, be able to keep seniors connected uh, that are shut in, uh, that are still living at home. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, I'm overwhelmed every day. I'm learning something new that somebody's tried to do. And, and, uh, I, I've, uh, also put a challenge out to everybody just because you want to create some positive atmosphere. And I went through our ec economic development and I said, okay, so our rec people are, you know, shut down at this point and they, they're starting to, you know, joint connect, uh, the restaurants that could provide food. Uh, companies that are willing to supply meals to our uh, frontline workers, as well as people that are shut in or people that are uh, unavailable to get funding right now to uh, be in because they can't work. Um, we've been able to build that, but also the champions that are out there, we've been having people to say, if you see something positive, tell us your story or tell us what's happening. 
and it's been positive. And it, it, you need those positive things through a, through a tough time. And I think it makes people feel better. And uh, it's all about uh, how if we can keep everybody's attitude in the right spot, and especially now when it's, you know, we're all past the 50 day mark of, uh, of this shutdown, it's been extremely stressful for a lot of people. Um, I think too, of the innovations yet to come is how we start back up to get everybody back to work. How do we get the economy to, uh, back going again uh, to be able to manage the risk uh, similar to what Sweden's done, you know, to the most vulnerable, uh, Germany and, uh, and I, I see New Zealand as well as Korea now have done a terrific job of uh, getting people back to work. And my attitude is, should we be testing everybody and how many of us have been exposed and not aware of it? And I think this is something else we've really found is people that are testing positive said they feel fine and never, you know, they're not showing any signs. So how many of us have been exposed and, uh, you know, and if we have um, had the virus, can we get back to work to get the economies going and to help serve our people better? I, I think that's, but again, we have to protect the most vulnerable and that's our seniors or people, you know, with compromised health or anybody that's been through cancer treatments. And I know I have that with my father and my family and along with my brother. So those are the ones that you have to protect and, and they're, they're finding it tough. The isolation is really, really tough. Well, that's interesting because, you know, one of the hardest parts, I think, of this crisis is exactly that, that at a time when we most need each other, we most need to connect with each other and collaborate, we're forced to be apart. Um, how is your community responding to that? It, it's, it's not perfect, I'll tell you that. Uh, um, and I, I got to tell you, I think that's the other thing, too, is we've really found, and I, I'll have to, I'll tell you that my biggest issue that I've received as mayor of something that's very tough is basically having access to uh, broadband so they can connect with people. Uh, the grocery stores have been very good to order online, but again, it's only as good as when the service works. <laughs> and I, I, I think that's some of it, but I think people are learning to find where it is. Uh, I'm finding a lot of people walk along the sidewalk and they'll, you know, yell in and talk to their neighbor off the front porch. Um, you're starting to see people are respecting and know what we have to do. We have to keep everybody safe, but we have to check in to make sure everybody's okay. And what's positive is when you even go to pick uh, your groceries up at the, at the door of the grocery store that you have already pre-ordered, everybody's very congenial, very respectful, and is always asking, how are you doing? And I think that's really important. And, and to me, about a rural community, uh, we are connected. We, everybody knows what their neighbor is. Um, we, we, you know, we, to me, uh, we have our own community watch, and you know, it's the busybody system, <laughs> knows what everybody's doing. Uh, when you get into the major urban areas, a lot of people even in the condos don't even know who their neighbor is. And, uh, and to me is maybe this is what it's going to do is we'll start to find who the neighborhood is and who we are. Um, you know, remember when we had the big blackout, uh, you know, that hit uh, uh, Ontario as well as part of New York and Ohio. And I don't know if it affected New Jersey at that time, but uh, it did bring communities together. And I'm starting to see things like that starting to happen and people are getting innovative to keep the distance. But I think it's been long enough that we're trying to find solutions and uh, families. And one thing that I got to say too is every time there's a holiday, our police generally find, you know, that's when uh, uh, the police are very busy resolving issues, you know, especially uh, confrontations at home because people just can't get along together under the same roof. And we were prepared. Our police have been prepared that this was going to be an issue. And it, it, it's gone up a little bit, but it's not as bad as what we were predicting it was going to be. So I think people realize it's a crisis. We have to figure out a way to learn to work together. And uh, to me, to me is a, there might be a few more divorces maybe when it's all said and done, who knows. But I think we're going to have a baby boom too, because there's no sports, there's no nothing going on. So we'll have to we'll have to see. 
We'll know in a few months. That's a very positive note. Uh, Thank you. Uh, It's funny, I remember very distinctly when 9-11 happened, you know, New York City is, of course, famous for people being brusque with each other. And for a period of a few months, it was those everyone, every single person in that city was somebody's brother or sister. It was just amazing. And I think the same thing, I see it as well. So I think it's one of those positive outcomes we We'd rather not have, and yet, boy, are we blessed by it. So, you sure Mayor are. Thompson, I want to thank you so much for taking time away from uh, your duties managing this crisis and sharing some of your insights with us. So my, my very best wishes to you, your family, your friends, your coworkers, and, of course, to the people of Caledon. Well, thank you very much, Robert, and the same with you and your New Jersey. Our, our, as much as we're going through a crisis, we've sure seen what uh, the epicenter where you've experienced, what you've been going through, and we've sure been thinking about welfare of everybody in your area as well. Well, thank you. The No Place But Home series is produced by the Intelligent Community Forum as a service to its network of intelligent communities and other city leaders all around the world. Our series producer is Matthew Owen. In future episodes, we'll be speaking with more leaders of intelligent communities, as well as uh, companies introducing innovative solutions to help communities cope with this crisis that has been rolling on for so long. To view prior conversations, go to intelligentcommunity.org slash COVID-19. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at New Communities or on LinkedIn or Facebook by searching for Intelligent Community Forum. For ICF, this is Robert Bell.